My name is Natasha Reese McLaughlin, and I'm a senior researcher at Mathematica, and I was part of the Asthma Affinity Group Technical Assistance Team. And today I'm joined by my CMS colleague, Jessica Lee, as well as members from two of our state teams who will share a bit about their Asthma Affinity Group experience. From Texas, we have Susanna Benyate, and from California, we have Arlene Silva, Rahel Nagesh, Helen Lee, and Rosa Reyes. Next slide, please. Before we begin, I'll go over a few housekeeping items. First, as you'll likely notice, you are all muted upon entry. We ask that you remain on mute. There'll be a 10 minute Q&A session at the end of the presentations. Please submit questions using the chat panel. The webinar team will monitor the chat throughout today's presentation, so, so feel free to ask questions as you have them. You can also use the chat feature to contact our event producer, Derek Mitchell, if you have any technical issues. At the end of today's webinar, there'll be a pop-up survey. We ask that you kindly take a minute to respond before closing the webinar. And finally, in the next few weeks, a recording of the presentation and the slides will be available on Medicaid.gov. We will send an email once they are posted. Next slide, please. Now, diving into today's webinar, Jessica Lee from CMS will first provide an overview of the CMS Quality Improvement Technical Assistance Program. Then, I'll briefly provide some background on the Improving Asthma Control Affinity Group. The main event today are our two state spotlights. First, the California team will discuss their project to improve asthma control among Black and African American beneficiaries. Then, the Texas team will share their work improving asthma control for children. Following the state presentations, there'll be opportunity for you to ask the team's questions. We'll end the webinar by sharing some upcoming quality improvement technical assistance opportunities. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jessica. Thank you so much, Natasha. Uh, hello and welcome. I'm Jessica Lee, the Medical Officer in the Division of Quality and Health Outcomes in the Center for Medicaid and CHIP Services at CMS. Our division is home to our center's quality improvement program, which supports state Medicaid and CHIP programs and their QI partners with resources, tools, and expert knowledge to improve care and outcomes for Medicaid and CHIP beneficiaries. Affinity groups are a key element of our programming. Uh, affinity groups are topic-specific action-oriented groups that help states build QI knowledge and skills, develop QI projects, and scale up, implement, and spread QI initiatives. These affinity groups are accompanied by webinars that include topical information and state QI success stories like the one you'll hear here today. I'm a practicing pulmonologist and I so deeply appreciate the work um, that's been done to improve care and outcomes for people with asthma. We'd like to thank the eight states that participated in the Improving Asthma Control Affinity Group and indeed all of the states that have engaged in quality improvement activities with us. We have been so inspired by your commitment to improving care and enriched by the learning and projects you share with, us, with other states and with us. And with that, I will turn it over to Natasha. Wonderful, thanks, Jessica. So of the affinity groups that Jessica mentioned, the first one was improving asthma control. And asthma was one of the topics selected for the QITA program because of its impact on Medicaid and CHIP populations and programs. Asthma places a large economic burden on the U.S. as well as in each state, with yearly medical costs associated with asthma surpassing $50 billion. In addition to the large medical costs, there's also large social costs. Adults with asthma miss an average of five days of work each year and is the leading cause of school absenteeism. Additionally, the burden of asthma falls disproportionately on minority populations. Black children are twice as likely to be diagnosed with asthma than white or Hispanic children. As I said earlier, these financial and social costs place a burden on Medicaid and CHIP programs and populations. Medicaid is the most common primary payer for asthma-related hospital and emergency department visits, and roughly 10% of Medicaid and CHIP beneficiaries have asthma. While there's no cure for asthma, it can be effectively managed to prevent exacerbations. For this reason, CMS saw improving asthma control as an opportunity for Medicaid and CHIP programs to remove quality and health outcomes and reduce costs. Next slide. So with that in mind, CMS launched the Asthma Affinity Group with the overall goal of supporting teams to drive measurable improvement in asthma control. Asthma control includes clinical, environmental, and community-based strategies or interventions that help people with asthma achieve better health. To achieve improved asthma control, the Affinity Group sought to expand state Medicaid and CHIP staff knowledge of evidence-based asthma interventions, share state experiences and lessons learned from implementing asthma interventions, 
teach teams how to use data-driven approaches to test and evaluate an asthma project, support teams in working with quality improvement partners, including providers and communities, and improve the state's quality improvement skills by reviewing and using quality improvement science. Next slide, please. The Asthma Control Affinity Group ran from April 2020 to June 2022 and had a total of eight state participants, Washington State, California, Colorado, Texas, Missouri, Louisiana, New Jersey, and Puerto Rico. As you probably noted, the Affinity Group coincided with the public health emergency. Despite the many challenges and competing priorities that came with the public health prior emergency, these state teams found ways to continue their QI work on asthma. Next slide, please. Each state team had their own goals and tested different asthma ideas. This slide and the next share very brief descriptions of several years of hard work conducted by each of the teams. Instead of reading the descriptions today, I'll instead highlight some themes that emerged across the teams. Both our Puerto Rico and Louisiana team worked on managed care organizations to increase home visits for children with uncontrolled asthma. The California and Washington teams both worked to address asthma disparities by working with providers. The Californian team, as you'll hear shortly, also conducted member outreach. Moving to our last four teams, the Missouri and Texas teams focused on improving asthma management among children. Missouri fostered connections between managed care organizations and health homes. Meanwhile, the Texas team convened several managed care organizations and provided data support. Finally, the New Jersey and Colorado teams focused on reducing asthma-related hospital use by creating partnerships. The New Jersey team created partnerships between the state Medicaid agency and Department of Public Health, and the Colorado Medicaid team partnered with their regional accountability entity. With that, I'll turn the presentation over to our wonderful state teams. First, we'll hear from California. I'll turn the presentation over to Arlene Silvera from California's Medi-Cal agency to introduce her team. Thank you so much, Natasha. Hello, everyone. My name is Arlene Silva, and I'm a nurse consultant specialist with the California Department of Healthcare Services. I work on quality improvement and health equity under the quality and population health management within our department. We recognize the significance of managing and controlling asthma exacerbations, and we strive to implement innovative approaches through our partnerships with our managed care plans and our community partners. As we strive to do more work on AMR measure, California's performance on CMS core measure asthma medication ratio is above the national median in measurement year 2020. In measurement year 2021 alone, 52%, that is 29 out of 56 of our plan reporting units surpassed NCQA's 50th percentile benchmark. DHCS is proud of the work of our plan partners, in particular, the work of Alameda Alliance for Health whose AMR rate in measurement year 2021 is significantly better compared to their peers using California's medical managed care weighted average. Their work has been shared with their plan or their MCO peers through our California's Quality Improvement Toolkit, which is a rep repository of resources and promising practices in California. In this session, it's an honor to introduce our presenters who will be discussing the importance of an integrated approach to member outreach among Black African American medical beneficiaries that Alameda Alliance has implemented through CMS-led Affinity Group. Our first presenter is Dr. Helen Lee, who is the Senior Director of Pharmacy Services at Alameda Alliance for Health with 21 years of pharmacy and healthcare leadership experience in managed care. Dr. Lee is serving as a DHCS Medi-Cal Contract Drug Advisory Committee member, and she's also a certified diversity executive. Our next presenter is Dr. Rahel Nugash, is a primary supervisor of pharmacy services at Alameda Alliance for Health. She started her career as an inpatient pharmacist and came to the Alliance as a transition of care pharmacist in case management and then worked as a clinical and lead clinical pharmacist and pharmacy services. Our last but not the least is Rosa Reyes, a certified health education specialist who is a disease management health educator of quality improvement at Alameda Alliance for Health. So without further ado, I'm passing this on to Dr. Lee. 
Go ahead, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Thanks, Arlene. So we'll go to the next slide. And good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. So today we'll be uh, briefly talking about Alameda Alliance for Health and the project um, outcomes. So Alameda Alliance for Health is a medical managed care health plan, and we are a public not-for-profit managed care. Uh, we serve over 320,000 children and adults in Alameda County since January of 1996. And our team was comprised of various different healthcare services and operation team, such as pharmacy services, quality improvement, health program, complex case management, analytics, provider relationship, and of course, the senior leadership. Next slide. So, um, you know, as you know, individuals with recent need for oral corticosteroid for asthma are at increased risk of COVID-19 related death. And also, um, as Arlene um, shared, um, you know, AMR is one of the key healthcare effective data information set known as the HEDIS metrics. Um, and so um, the AMR, which is asthma medication ratio measure is defined as percentage of beneficiary identified as having persistent asthma and had a ratio of control medications to total asthma medications of 50% or greater during the measurement year. And um, the, the control medications are such as inhaled corticosteroid or long acting beta agonists. In an ideal world, the patient's asthma would be managed so that no rescue medications such as arbuterol would be needed. Thus, the ratio should be one on one of control medication divided by one unit of control medication. Therefore, lower ratios indicate the patient using more rescue medications. Next slide. We try to put it into one slide just to show you what is the issue. The issue is among Black adults age 21 to 44. We identify health disparity of poor asthma control due to poor asthma medication ratio. So our goal was to improve asthma self-management for approximately 200 or more black adults, um, such as one, 63% and 63.6% or more of the target population have an AMR ratio 50% or higher, and two, asthma-related emergency department visit decrease. Our strategy was to contact AMR groups separately by score, conduct a survey, and make a proper interventions. And our interventions included coordination of primary care provider appointments, transportation, providing asthma education, mailing education materials, and finally, offering a live pharmacist consult. Now, I'm going to give this presentation to Rosa, and she will try to elaborate our outreach attempt for three groups. Go ahead. Thank you, Helen. So our outreach interventions took place between February 2021 and March of 2022, which are marked by a flag or triangle on the timeline at the bottom. The interventions were separated into three different groups based on AMR scores, and we followed QI's best practice by starting with a small group of 12 members for our first group, and then increasing the amount of members per group subsequently. Next slide, please. The first outreach group happened in February 2021, where we outreached to 12 members with AMR rates between 0 0.4 and 0 0.49. And out of the 12 members, six members completed our survey and received at least one of our interventions, providing a total of nine interventions, which included transportation aid for two members, asthma education for four members, help with scheduling appointments for two members, and one pharmacist formulary assistance. We then conducted a follow-up outreach call in September for the same 12 members. 
we were able to successfully reach two members for whom we were able to provide at least one intervention. Both members received asthma education and a pharmacist consult, and one member received a case management referral. Next slide, please, and I'll pass it on to Rahel. Thank you, Rosa. So here um, on this slide, we're looking at the monthly AMR by member results for group one outreach calls. So first, we can take a look at the AMR goal line marked in red to see those that had improved scores or decreased scores from that 0.5 goal. We can see that three out of six members had AMR compliance after our outreach that's marked with the first arrow at the bottom of the graph um, indicating uh, outreach call intervention. So I can also take a look at each of the members to demonstrate and give more information on what happened for those who fell below the line. So first, we can start with member four that's in light green. So here we see a sharp drop off in their AMR score in September. When you looked at our records, we noted that um, the sudden decline was because the member was no longer enrolled with the plan. So this would explain the sharp decline. Next, looking at member five in black, we see a decrease in AMR score after our intervention. And when we took a look at our records, we noticed that the member was actually filling a non-NCQA approved control inhaler after our intervention. So as a note here, our reports only capture NCQA approved control inhalers. Therefore, the member's AMR in this case was actually compliant. If we look at member three marked in light blue, we do see a decline in AMR score after our call. When we looked at our records, we saw that this member was also filling a non-NCQA approved control inhaler. Therefore, their AMR score was also compliant. And then lastly, if we look at member one in orange, uh, we do see a decline in their AMR. Our records show that this member uh, fell out of eligibility because they switched to our group care line of business. So the data here doesn't reflect all of the medications used. So after individual member review, we concluded that at least five out of six of these members actually had AMR compliant rates after our intervention. Next slide. Here we're looking at the monthly asthma-related ER visits for outreach group one in 2021. Here we're pointing out that our outreach calls were made in February, so we see that arrow pointing down to indicate when we called. And we're noting here that there were two ER visits in July and November. This was for two different members. All of the other members had no asthma-related ER visits. Next slide. I'll hand it over to Rosa. Right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, so then in February 2021, we launched our second outreach group of 15 members and with AMR scores between 0 0.3 and 0 0.39, we were able to reach five of the 15 members and provided at least one intervention per member with a total of seven interventions. Three members received transportation assistance, two members were provided with asthma education, one member received a pharmacy consult, and lastly, one member was referred to Beacon, our behavioral health service. Next slide, please. Here, I'll highlight more about the data. So we're looking at the monthly AMR by member for outreach group two from 2021 to 2022. So here we're seeing a positive shift after our September to October outreach calls. So that's shown with the arrow pointing up. And here we're showing that four out of five members had AMR improvement after our interventions. Three out of five reached AMR compliance by January 2022. Next slide. Here we're taking a look at the monthly asthma-related ER visits for Outreach Group 2 in 2021. I'll note that all of the activity prior to our outreach call related to 11 asthma-related ER visits, and this was all for one member and prior to our call. After our call, there was uh, no ER asthma-related visits in 2021. Next slide. 
Lastly, our third outreach group took place from January to March of 2022. We reached out to 35 members with the lowest AMR scores of 0 0.2 to 0 0.29 and we were able to reach 12 members, of which seven agreed to complete our survey. All seven members received at least one intervention with a total of 14 interventions. So five members received transportation assistance, five members were provided with asthma education, three members were offered smoking cessation support, and one member was referred to Beacon, our behavioral health service. Unfortunately, our data is currently pending for this group, so we won't be able to share it with you all today, but we have overall AMR results and ER results. Next slide, please. Here we're taking a look at the AMR compliance rate for all groups. So this ranges from 2019 to January 2022. Here we're highlighting our group one and group two outreach calls in February and between September and October. We'll also note that the data here shows an increase in AMR compliance rate after our first and second outreach uh, call intervention that is approaching that 63.6% goal line at the top that's marked in turquoise. Next slide. Here we're showing our asthma-related ER visits for all groups. So this ranges from 2019 to 2021. And as we can see, the, does, the data doesn't seem to reveal much change as it relates to the ER visits over this um, uh, three-year time span. Next slide. Here we're looking at lessons learned. So first, we noticed that this project um, had a lot of interest and openness. Um, as it relates to the asthma survey, and we also had a lot of interventions. So um, all of the live calls in group one and group two uh, agreed to the survey. So when we were able to reach members, uh, they were receptive to continue conversation about their asthma. In group three, um, we had 58% uh, of the live calls uh, agreeing to the survey. So overall, it was a total of about 78% who were completing the survey and receiving assistance. We also uh, learned that the essential teams for this project varied over the course of um, the project length, and it included pharmacy services, quality improvement, health programs, and complex case management. We also noticed that getting access to active member phone numbers was a significant barrier, and a lot of time was spent um, trying to acquire the appropriate numbers to call. Lastly, we learned that potential data skewing should be considered when interpreting AMR scores. So as we mentioned before, um, an example would be the inaccurately, inaccurately low AMR scores due to limited NCQA-approved medications. So for instance, we had members who were filling, um, as an example, generic advert discus every month, but their AMR score was below 0.5. Also, some members lost appropriate enrollment, and so they were no longer um, eligible for the project, and their scores were no longer reflecting their medications that were being used. Next slide. Okay, so during the course of our project, the affinity group provided a lot of support during group meetings where they helped us organize and summarize appropriate data, goals, and interventions. Uh, for example, they encouraged us to use a PDSA and to think about study design. They provided resources, tools that help catalyze our project movement and understanding with internal departments. And the TA teams included subject matter experts who help validate appropriate project approach during our one-on-one -on -one state calls. So we are appreciative of their support and knowledge throughout the process of this project. Next slide, please. In regards to next steps, we are looking to increase provider involvement to optimize improved outcomes. Some of the interventions that we are looking at are a collaboration with the California Department of Public Health to create videos for providers and to deliver provider education through fax blasts. 
We would also like to increase QI department-driven ASMA initiatives for continued medical accountability set or MCAS measures for healthcare delivery systems, which include AMR HEDIS measure projects. And currently our MCAS AMR HEDIS measure is above benchmark. So we would like to continue this trajectory. Um, this will conclude the end of our presentation. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much to the, for the California team for that wonderful presentation. I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Susanna Benyate, who will share highlights from Texas's Affinity Group project. Okay, hello, good afternoon all. I am Susanna Benyate from the Texas Health and Human Services Commission in the Medicaid and CHIP Services Division. Uh, for this uh, project, I served as the project coordinator for the Tex Texas Asthma Control Project. Um, for STAR children in the Nueces and Harris service areas, um, Texas decided to uh, apply and, and join the Asthma Affinity Group because uh, first it supported our Texas HHSC business plan, which included a specific goal to improve health outcomes for children with chronic asthma. Um, and then additionally, our sister state public health agency, the Department of State Health Services, uh, at the time had data that showed that Medicaid paid for over 60% of total emergency department visits uh, for children in our, in our state. Um, and then lastly, uh, our uh, Medicaid and CHIP asthma related quality measures like the asthma medication ratio um, or asthma related potentially preventable uh, admissions or PPAs did show a need for improvement among the our Medicaid and CHIP managed care program. So uh, just a great opportunity for Texas to, to join the affinity group um, and learn from the other states. Uh, so I'm really excited to share how Texas approached um, this project, and so we can go on to the next slide. Okay, first, I would like to share who was included in the Texas core team. Um, it was the Texas Health and Human Services uh, Commission in the Medicaid and CHIP Services Division that led the, this initiative for Team Texas. Um, from our Medicaid area, um, we were joined by one of our associate medical directors who has experience in family medicine, and then uh, folks from our Medicaid quality team. Our core team also included um, our uh, public health state agency, the Department of State Health Services, and including um, their team from uh, the team called the Texas Asthma Control Program. So uh, that agency has a statewide asthma uh, collaborative. Um, so that a, a wealth of resources and connections that um, we uh, really uh, use for this project. And then our core team also consisted of Medicaid managed care organization partners. Next slide. On this slide, I'd like to share the Texas aid statement. Um, I won't read through the uh, aim statement itself. I will discuss our selected population and sort of why we, we chose um, this group and, and these areas and then discuss our outcome goals. Uh, our selected population was children in STAR who resided in the Nueces and Harris service areas. STAR is our uh, one of our Medicaid managed care programs, uh, but most of our children, children's Medicaid beneficiaries receive services through STAR. Um, so that's why we chose uh, that managed care program. And then we focused on these two parts um, of Texas, there's a map there on your screen, uh, Harris and Nueces, so on the south and southeast side of Texas. Uh, we chose these two service areas because um, one, Nueces at the time had the lowest 
asthma medication ratio compared to all of our other service areas. And then uh, Harris was selected because um, our Medicaid uh, agency had existing partnerships with um, MCOs uh, who were interested in asthma control improvement. So uh, those are sort of the reasons why we, we focused on those two areas. And our outcome goal was to reduce asthma related potentially preventable admissions or PPAs and potentially preventable emergency visits or PPVs by 20%. And then to also improve the uh, asthma medication ratio to 75%. And then just keeping in mind that our, our baseline data was 2019 data. Next slide. And in Texas, we uh, did have certain drivers that initially helped the team to tailor our interventions. Um, these drivers, including, uh, includes making sure we had interventions that uh, were geared at providing clinically appropriate care, providing non-clinical care appropriate to the level of asthma severity, and improving care coordination for members with asthma. And then here on the right part of your screen under the measures box, um, some of the measures we were uh, interested in uh, to track were the asthma medication ratio, like uh, California, uh, asthma-related emergency department visits, inpatient admissions, uh, and then several other measures related to uh, asthma-related uh, specialist visits. Next slide. For this affinity group, uh, Texas developed our, our own model, which, which we've applied to other affinity, affinity groups we participated in. But in this model, uh, the Texas Medicaid and CHIP agency, we receive technical assistance and resources and knowledge from CMS and Mathematica. Uh, this includes tools to organ like tools to uh, organize the QI projects and QI best practices, um, including insights uh, on lessons learned and barriers faced by other participating states. And so the HHSC we uh, took in this technical assistance and then convened a core team that consisted of other state agency staff. MCO staff, um, and in this forum, the state agency provided project direction and guidance, and then really encouraged the, the core team to share learning with one another and, and project updates. Um, and it was actually then the MCOs who, based on the learnings uh, from the core team, um, they implemented their own and very, very different QI asthma projects. Um, so this is in summary what, what the Texas model uh, looked like and has worked really well for, for, for uh, our Medicaid agency for other affinity groups. Next slide. And so now to go into more detail on, on the asthma affinity group. In year one, we really uh, focused on establishing relationships with our external partners, that includes our, our MCOs, and really delved into learning what the asthma landscape looked like across the state. Uh, and just to note, year one was from June 2020 through June 2021. Um, so initially, HHSC, we sent a survey to all of our Medicaid and CHIP MCOs to learn about um, their disease management programs and their asthma-related projects and interventions. Uh, some of the survey questions uh, that were included were um, what asthma self-management initiatives does your disease management program provide? 
what is your definition for a member with asthma? Uh, how can a MCO's provider network use um, this data, or if, if that's an option that's available? And then a description of the MCO's uh, asthma education programs, any uh, home environmental service referrals they provide their members, and then any sort of related case management or, or value added services. So some key takeaways from the survey was that uh, the MCOs were actually doing uh, several asthma related uh, initiatives uh, for their Medicaid and CHIP members. Another really interesting way we learned was that um, our MCOs, and keep in mind, we have 17 <laughs> MCOs in Texas. So the MCOs had varying definitions for quote members with asthma. Um, so the after uh, receiving the responses for the survey, um, HHSC, we recruited six MCOs to participate in the asthma affinity group. Um, the way we selected the MCOs was one, uh, we selected the MCOs in Nueces uh, who had an asthma medication ratio uh, below the 25th and 50th national percentile in that S service area. And then for some of our MCOs, uh, what it, sort of what I mentioned earlier, our Medicaid agency had existing relationships with the associate medical directors with that MCO who were actually pediatric pulmonologists and had a really uh, great passion for uh, asthma control improvement. So we thought they're, they'd be great champions for, for uh, this project. And so after selecting our six MCOs, uh, Team Texas, we convened a two work group series. Um, work group one focused on uh, creating standard definitions for members with asthma uh, and delve deeper into risk stratis stratification. And then work group two uh, focus on assessing existing asthma programs in those two specific service areas. Um, and then learning about different asthma education materials that some of our community based uh, organizations use. Uh, and I can share briefly who participated in each work group. So work group one, um, we, uh, with help from our uh, sister public health agency, DSHS, um, we convened several providers from across the state to provide that expertise needed for work group one. And then work group two, we uh, uh, reached out to local health departments who had asthma programs, um, community health centers who serve those two service areas to provide that more specific insight. Next slide. Okay, and so in year one, after uh, that sort of uh, baseline work to, to understand the asthma landscape, um, the MCO selected their QI project ideas and their ideas varied. Um, most of the MCOs selected a different QI project idea. Uh, some MCOs chose to pursue a texting campaign, uh, a referral system to asthma related resources like uh, uh, environmental home, uh, home environmental services, um, and home weatherization services. Uh, some MCOs chose to enhance existing case care, case management programs for their members with asthma by developing um, new assessments for for those members, and then based on the work from one of the work groups about uh, learning more about the definition for members with asthma, some MCOs went ahead and updated their asthma registry uh, using that new definition. Um, then in year one, uh, the agency, HHSC, we also published guidance on 
how asthma education was covered by our, our Medicaid internship program. So that was sort of ten, something that happened tangentially to, to this uh, more QI focused work. And then in year one, HHSC also created a, a data dashboard for asthma related utilization data, which you will see in the next two slides. Next slide. Okay, so in this slide, um, HHSC developed a Tableau dashboard uh, specifically for these two service areas and for the six MCOs. Um, the data uh, dashboards can be filtered by age group, race, ethnicity, and sex. Um, this particular one uh, tracks asthma related ER visits and inpatient hospitalization data. We started off with uh, 2019 data as our baseline. Um, and then we have, currently we have 2020 and 21 data. You'll see that in 2020, again, in hindsight, this affinity group started right in the middle of, of 2020. Um, there is a very noticeable dip in our uh, asthma percent of uh, asthma ER visits per 1,000 member rate, and also our asthma-related inpatient admissions per 1,000 rate. Um, so next slide. And then one of the other pages in our dashboard focus on specialists like uh, member utilization of certified respiratory care practitioners, allergists, and pulmonologists. Um, we saw similar trends for for uh, this data too than the previous slide in terms of a slide dip in 2020. Um, and in this uh, dashboard, we could also filter by the same um, variables as the previous slide. Next slide. Okay, and in Texas, the MCOs actually began implementing the care projects in in year two, but by that point, I think we all had a very solid foundation of, of QI and the PDSA cycles. Um, so the MCOs they implemented their QI projects uh, in June 2021. They submitted plan to act study cycles to HHSC for review. Uh, each did develop run charts for the first six months of their pilot projects. And uh, towards the end of year two, some MCOs did expand their QI projects to other areas and populations. Um, and so during year two, how HHSC supported each MCO is uh, by providing the PDSA cycle worksheets, the run chart maker templates. And then we also shared the specifications that we use for the HHSC Tableau data dashboard, um, and then also resources on how to expand their QI projects. And again, this is with support from CMS and Mathematica, um, who provided a lot of these research or most of these resources. Next slide. And as far as lesson learned, um, the first one is that having a consistent definition for members with asthma with, with such a large number of MCOs, um, again, was a, a, a surprising find from that survey. And uh, ultimately, in work group one took a little bit longer than expected to, to create a, a consistent definition, but ultimately valuable time um, well spent because it was the foundation for the development of the data dashboard. Um, the second is that starting with a small number of members, as recommended by uh, the QI method we were using, this required coaching to the MCOs um, because MCOs are definitely more accustomed to operating projects at a larger scale. Um, this is something that Team Texas with our other affinity groups has really tried to, to fine tune with, with coaching MCOs to 
to focus on a smaller number of members with, with each PDSA cycle. Um, the next lesson learned is that small, small, small scale interventions will not always result in an immediate improvement for the AMR for the selective population in the service area and really to be flexible and open to pivoting, um, especially when there are staff changes. Um, what helped Team Texas and the MCO partners was having a consistent champion who was the main point of contact with the state. Next slide. Okay, and reflections on the affinity group. Uh, the first one is that the all state workshops uh, were really helpful to Team Texas because we could see other barriers and successes of other state participants. Um, also, uh, the addition of a second year to the affinity group provided long term support because, as you saw, we the MCOs did not start implementing until towards the end uh, of year one. So, uh, having that year two was was uh, critical for, for Team Texas. Um, and then as part of participating in this affinity group, um, both state and, and MCO staff used, uh, were offered the access to quality improvement courses to learn about QI methods. So that really helped um, staff who might not be as familiar with QI, but overall uh, participating in the this affinity group helped HHSC strengthen relationships with MCOs, with our community stakeholders, and then uh, also develop some policy guidance related to asthma. And then next steps for Team Texas is to continue to monitor our asthma related data and uh, add our 2022 data to the Tableau dashboard, uh, continue to participate in um, other forums with uh, asthma stakeholders across Texas. And as I mentioned, apply and improve upon our, our Texas model for uh, other affinity groups that we participate in. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Susanna. I'm going to open the floor up for questions and discussions. Um, so again, please chat your questions into the chat box. Um, but we did receive our first question, and it's for both teams. But given the successes of your affinity group project, does your state have plans to spread the interventions to other plans, populations, and geographic areas? Would one of the teams like to start? This is Susanna. I, I can uh, provide the first response. So uh, several of the MCOs for our core team did end up um, expanding their projects to either one of their other service areas or maybe to another population. Um, so yes, and then HHSC, we continue to participate in, in sort of statewide asthma forums and, and try to um, uh, share information about the incredible work that the MCOs did in, in those forums as well. Yeah, and also for California, um, we had a chance to present this information at the HCS Global Drug Utilization Review Board, and several plans did express their interest. So we've been sharing our information, the collaterals. Um, and also, uh, the HCS did actually incorporate our information as a part of the toolkits for providers. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Our second question is for the California team. Reaching out uh, to members uh, was challenging, um, but you did very well overall. Do you have any other ideas on how to reach more folks going forward? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it definitely takes, um, you know, the time to call and, and have the appropriate numbers. Um, we would like to expand. I think that um, 
at this point, it does seem like it just is uh, something that may require, um, you know, consistent outreach from maybe uh, a group of people or at least two or three. Um, with our groups, it ranged from the first group had uh, two outreaches initially and one pharmacist. The second group had one uh, individual and the third had one. So it could be um, in order to expand reasonable to include uh, maybe a, you know, a larger outreach group of individuals. So yes, expanding would be, is, is good. All right, thank you for that, Rahel. Bef um, I just want to correct myself. I earlier said to please uh, put questions into the chat, but actually there should be a Q&A feature on your screen. If you don't see it, there is a uh, three dots next to the chat um, feature, and that should open up to a Q&A function. So please um, submit questions there. Um, but we have our third question, which is for Team Texas. Susanna, could you say more about how you coached your managed care organizations? What kind of questions were asked and how they were addressed? Yeah, so initially, um, and I can share more how, how we made improvements upon how we coach our MCOs with the other two affiliated groups we've participated in since this one. Um, so we initially start with uh, assessing and, and talking with the MCOs about one, their, their data capabilities, um, and any barriers they, they have uh, with tracking data. Um, and then we also ask an interesting question at the beginning, what do you wish you could track? Um, uh, so that's sort of the first step. We, we introduce the, cons the QI concepts that we learn from CMS and Mathematica, um, like the different types of measures, uh, what, uh, run chart is, uh, what a PDSA uh, cycle method is. So we uh, teach the MCOs those foundations uh, in the first couple of months. And then afterwards, the MCOs, they uh, have the flexibility um, to choose their own uh, project, their own intervention. Um, and then the state agency we review each month with the mcos their pdsa cycle worksheet um mcos can ask any questions they let us know of any barriers or successes and lessons learned um, with each pdsa cycle worksheet um, and then for any questions that uh, the agency we might get uh, stuck on or need a little bit more help on, that's when uh, we like to go to CMS and Mathematica for, for their technical assistance and expertise. Um, so we've definitely fine-tuned how we coach MCOs uh, throughout the years. Uh, so it, so far we've seen it's a, a strategy that works for, for Texas. Great. A uh, quick follow up um, was um, how frequently did you meet with your MCOs and did you meet with them all together or separately? So for this asthma affinity group, uh, it was definitely sort of the, the I see it as the, the, the guinea pig of how we coached MCOs. So for the asthma affinity group, we met all together, all the MCOs together once a month for year one, and then for year two, uh, we met every other month. But for the other two affinity groups after this asthma affinity group, we fine tuned that and found it more successful to meet individually uh, with each MCO on a monthly basis to get that one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, that they might need. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Susanna. Um, we have another question that came in for California um, regarding the HEATIST measure. Um, could you say a little bit more about the medications that were not included in it and if you have plans to use a different measure moving forward? Um, I can address the question. I think um, the question is relating to the NCQA approved list 
So we did see that um, there were some medications that were not captured with our data. Um, so, you know, it's just um, on our end, we just have to be aware of the NCQA approved list of medications. And as new medications enter the market, like the generic Advair discus, um, you know, we just have to take into account that um, the NCQA uh, approved list may not uh, be at the same speed as the market. So um, at this time, it's just something that um, we're looking out for. But yes, it is something that we'd want to update in our search engines as well. Wonderful. Um, I just also want to remind the attendees that we will be making these slides available uh, after this presentation. Um, and then could you Actually, I'm seeing that we are running out of time for questions. Um, so thank you so much for that. Uh, next slide, please. First, I wanna do a huge thank you to our state presenters for sharing their stories and lessons learned, and a thank you to all of our eight teams for their work to improve asthma outcomes for their beneficiaries and their state. Before closing today, I wanna to share some upcoming quality improvement TA resources. First is the Medicaid and CHIP Quality Improvement Open School. Susanna from Texas spoke a little bit about this resource during her presentation today. Open School curriculum is designed to support Medicaid and CHIP staff develop, strengthen, and use QI skills. Participants have access to courses on how to conduct quality improvement projects. They also have access to the Institute of Healthcare Improvement's extensive resource library. If you're interested in participating, please fill out an expression of interest form at the link shown on the right side of the screen, www.ihi.org backslash MAC quality, M-A-C quality. Next slide, please. CMS also offers quality improvement office hours. These office hours are an opportunity for state Medicaid and CHIP teams to ask their quality improvement related questions to experts. Office hours are held weekly Three times a month, they're hosted by a quality improvement advisor, and once a month, they're hosted by a CMS representative from the Division of Quality and Health Outcomes. There's no need to sign up in advance. To join the, open, the office hours distribution list, please email the mailbox shown on the screen, macqualityimprovement at mathematica-mpr.com. Next slide. Finally, CMS offers a variety of on-demand quality improvement technical assistance. These resources are available on Medicaid.gov and include videos on how to get started on quality improvement, driver diagrams with evidence and experience-based quality improvement ideas, measurement strategies for quality improvement projects, and highlights from CMS's affinity group projects. CMS also offers one-on-one -on -one QI TA support via their mailbox shown here on the screen, Medicaid chip QI at cms.hhs.gov. The on-demand QI TA resources I just mentioned focus on specific priority populations. We're happy to announce that the asthma QI TA resources are already available on Medicaid.gov. Resources for tobacco, oral health, and postpartum care will become available later this spring. Resources, a bit after that, resources related to foster care populations and follow-up care for behavioral health will become available this summer. Finally, at the end of this year, CMS will release materials related to managed care quality improvement and well child visits. Again, if you have any questions, please contact the CMS quality improvement team at Medicaid chip at CMS or Medicaid chip QI at cms.hhs.gov. Thank you all for coming today and thanks again to our state speakers. If you can, we'd appreciate if you complete the webinar survey as you exit. Have a great rest of your day.